You might have been called unlovely or stupid or dumb or lazy. You might have been made to think that you're good for nothing or you're just too much. But you have been incorrectly labeled just like Ehud was. And the cross is proof. So I was in an airport once, and someone came up to me very excited to meet me out. It's one of my favorite places, by the way, to, to meet people who track with our ministry, have read our books, watch teachings, uh, just awesome opportunities. People, people come and just thank us. I wish you could experience that every time we did, that someone just says, thank you for the ministry of Fresh Life. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for putting these messages online. This is this has touched my woman. We ran into a woman running this week who stopped me and was like, "Oh my God, I'm listening to you right now." I was like, "That's amazing. Keep running." Uh, <laughs> eyes on the road, um, and it's just so great. Well, this one time, this guy comes up to me and goes, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe I get the chance to meet you in person. This is this is such a thrill. This is such a thrill. I, your ministry's touched my life in real deep ways." And I said, "Man, that's praise God, amazing." Um, he goes, "Your name your name's Louis, right?" I go. <laughs> No, my name's Levi. He goes, Giglio? I go, that's still Louie. Uh, but, <laughs> but the truth is, we've all experienced other people using words to describe us that are not accurate. And if you have ever had someone's heartless, thoughtless, cruel, unintentional at times, but incorrect labels spoken over you that you have been hurt by. My prayer is that this message would be used by God to help you to see your true identity in Christ. Come on, say amen if you need that, if you need that today. Um, title of this message is, I'm not what you think. Come on, shove, shove someone with your elbow and say, I'm not what you think. I'm not what you think. Judges chapter 3, let me read to you a passage of scripture that uh, was the inspiration behind the first pet I ever had when I moved out on my own. I had a fish that I named Ehud the left-handed Benjamite. That was the name of my fish. <laughs> and I am exactly as weird as you think I am. I was telling Olivia, I said, it's clear you're my daughter because the first fish she ever had, uh, she named Japheth's wife. <laughs> Japheth's wife. Now, Noah had three sons, and uh, the three sons had wives, but the Bible doesn't tell their names. It just says they had these three sons, and then they each had wives. And we used to read the Bible story to her. They would be like, this is, this is Japheth going in the ark, and this is Japheth's wife. And so when we said, what do you want to name the, the, the fish, she said Japheth's wife. She thought that was her name. So uh, <laughs> it's proof that she's my daughter, I suppose. Uh, even more effective than a parent uh, DNA test, I guess. Um, Judges 3, uh, I want to introduce you to Ehud, the left-handed Benjamite. It says, and the people of Israel again, someone say again, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord again. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab. How long? 18 years. Wow. Exactly as long as the woman had been bent over last week. Interesting. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. <laughs> the people of Israel sent them tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab, and Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, it's about 18 inches, in case you're not regularly measuring things with cubits. And he bound it on his right thigh. Which thigh? He's a left-handed man. His sword goes on his right thigh, under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, in case you're wondering, Eglon was a very fat man. 
And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal. I pray the Spirit would help us to all turn away from our idols and said, I have secret, a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded, silence. Everyone listen to this. But all his attendants went out from his presence. Inferred, of course, is that Ehud convinced the king this was a message he would want to hear alone. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand and took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade. Everyone say yuck. <laughs> For he did not pull the sword out of his belly and the dung came out in case you were wondering. <laughs> then Ehud went out into the porch from the cool roof chamber and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed because no one wanted to knock while the king was relieving himself in his cool rooftop chamber. And they were like, should we go in? You go in. You, do, do you hear anything? Do you hear any movement? I don't want to hear any of his movements. I, that's what the, <laughs> And they waited till they were embarrassed. These are the jokes, people. Um, once a youth pastor, always a youth pastor. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. And there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Syrah. And thus, Ehud, the left-handed Benjamite, delivered Israel from an oppression under this king, which had lasted 18 long years. I'm not what you think. Ehud is unique in the Bible in that he's one of three different places you can turn in scriptures to find clear teaching uh, about someone's orientation when it comes to their hand, which dominant hand was used most often. Ehud, the left-handed Benjamite. Now, we're in a series of messages that we've called the Wonderful Cross. And as we move towards Easter, because after all, we are Easter people, and hallelujah is our song. And as we move towards it, we're not just looking at it like, well, yeah, there was, you know, leap year. That was kind of neat. And that was an extra day. And it kind of messed with the calendars. And there's Groundhog's Day. And, you know, sure, Halloween's around the corner. No, our whole lives are oriented around Easter. Easter, Jesus uh, rose from the dead. Easter, uh, Jesus triumphantly defeated death and sin and hell in the grave. And that's why we're like, Jesus is the story, right? If you're like, yeah, there's lots of different religious leaders. No one like this. No one who just went around riding roughshod over the grave and offering that delicious, victorious power to you and to me who are all, hear me, too mortal. Oh, you got a lot of money? Oh, oh, you, you big, big shot, rich and famous? Can you stop death? Well, I can delay it with advanced medicine. Awesome. Wait longer. You too will die. It's that which we are powerless to do anything about. And Jesus went ahead and just destroyed it for us all. Anybody grateful? Anybody grateful for the... The resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So as we move towards Easter, what are we trying to do? We're trying to calibrate our hearts to leave no stone unturned in what he left for us in his cross 
And in his empty tomb, and more to the point, in his spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that lives in us, is willing to come upon us and moves in our midst, even now as we glorify Jesus. Because Jesus did say, when the spirit comes, he will glorify me. So what is the spirit seeking to do? He's seeking to bring the attention back to and keep it always on Jesus. Now, Isaiah 53 tells us that his trans, his wounds were for our transgressions, that his bruises were for our iniquities. And by the way, the word bruises is not a great translation. It literally means, if you look into that Hebrew word, being pulverized to pieces. So this isn't the bruise you got on your shin when you bumped into the coffee table getting water in the night and you didn't want to turn the lights on. Okay, we've all had those bruises. This is him being pulverized for our what? For our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. Now, again, we understand the concept of peace, but it's not just like, yeah, peace, man. It's not just the absence of conflict. Shalom is this idea that runs throughout scripture of wholeness, wholeness on the inside, wholeness on the outside. You know that feeling where everything, you just kind of realize for a moment, everything's okay right now. You ever have that moment? You're watching the sunset. Someone you love is right there. A cat's curled up on your lap and you just kind of almost like sigh a little bit. That contented sigh that says, ah, could it just last for 10 seconds? That's shalom. Inner, outer, external, wholeness. The chastisement for our shalom was upon him. And, and don't miss this. By his stripes, we are healed. There are seven places that Jesus' body bled while he hung on the cross that we know of for sure. We began with the back last week. We titled that message BRB. If you missed it, you can grab it on the podcast or on YouTube. But today we come to Jesus' left hand. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons in my life, and I've heard a lot of sermons reference the mighty right hand of God. Why? There's a lot of verses about how dope God's right hand is. Therefore, there are a lot of sermons that are really good about how great God's right hand is. In fact, I wrote a really good one this week for next Sunday. I hope you'll come back. It's awesome. Okay, I'm gonna preach, I'm gonna preach it like I stole it next Sunday, all right? But I was thinking this week, I have never in my life, and I was practically born under a pew. I've I guarantee you I've listened to more sermons than you have, okay? <laughs> And I have never heard anybody preach about God's left hand. Not a single time. And yet it wasn't with one hand he was nailed to the tree. By his wounds, we go free. He was pierced for us, pierced for you, pierced for me. So there were two nails that were driven through Jesus' hands, maybe his wrist, some say, that between the the, the bones of the radius and the ulna, the fused bones of the wrist would actually form a lock. If you put a nail through the hand, it would, it would tear right out between the fingers. So it could be his, his wrist, but, but there were two nails used in his hands. And today we want to focus all of our attention on Jesus's left hand. Any lefties in the room? As I raise my right hand, sorry. That's so rightist of me. Uh, <laughs> Any, any lefties in the house? Yeah, look around. Come on, this is your moment. When else do you get a moment, right? You have, you have the wrong scissors, the wrong notebooks, right? The, the, the dry erase boards don't work well. The chalk on the board is a mess, all right? OK, this is your moment. Come on, let's praise God for all the left-handed people in the house today. Now, it's good you get your moment, because throughout most of history, you've been looked at suspiciously, right? It's just weird but true that left-handedness has, for most of history, been a synonym with weird, mistrusted, <laughs> right? And potty. The le I love that God chose that this story about Ehud, the left-handed Benjamite, involves so much potty humor. Because when I went to Nepal on a mission trip, they told us in our orientation, never offer your left hand when you're shaking someone's hand. Never offer your left hand. They will look at you like you just slapped their mama. It's just you don't, you don't offer your left hand to people. And then I figured out why when I went to go to the bathroom for the first time, and it was just a hole in the ground and a bucket of water. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with all of these things? And where's the bathroom? <laughs> they said, well, that is the bathroom. You squat over the hole, and then where's the toilet paper? They said, that's what the bucket of water is for. Just use your left hand. 
I thought, dear God, <laughs> this is how I died. This is it right here. I'm not going to lie to you. They gave us another orientation about how it's illegal to share the gospel in Nepal because it's a Hindu kingdom. And uh, every time we were doing any ministry, we all ran the risk of getting arrested. And uh, I'm going to just level with you. This was scarier to me than that, right? The thought of dying in a prison, fine. I can handle it. No toilet paper? Jesus. <laughs> My left hand. So offering your left hand to someone, at the meals, they said, keep your left hand down below the table the whole meal. I was like, that makes sense, actually. <laughs> it's not hygienic. There was not even soap. It was just water, right, that had been used previously. <laughs> Lord, have mercy on us all. So the left hand is associated with the potty. It's associated with dishonor. It's associated in many uh, traditions across history and cultures with a curse. To be born wanting to use your left hand sort of basically just signals you out as strange, thus lightly esteemed. Uh, even as recently as 1955, this sort of thinking carried over. That was the year my mom was born. My grandma was old school. Now, I've shared before, my grandma came to faith in Christ just before her death in her 80s through this ministry. And I, it was just amazing that it happened. Praise God for it. She trusted Jesus at the very end of her life. She asked me to preach her funeral, which I was so happy to do. Uh, and when I went into her sewing room after her, her, her going to heaven to, to, with my family, comb through things and figure stuff out so that my grandpa, who was fleeing the country for tax reasons to give up his citizenship and live in Panama, a different sermon for a different day, um, <laughs> He uh, was saying, yeah, just everything's going away, so figure it all out. And, and we did. And, and I was so touched to walk into her sewing room where she had a TV attached to a computer and right next to it, a little notepad that said, to get Levi, colon, freshlifechurch.com, click live, click watch now. And I was blessed by that. So thank you, ministry. Thank you, church. Thank you, family of God. Thank you to every person who's ever given to this ministry for allowing uh, my grandma to, to come to know Jesus. That being said, she was old school. And I would just say it on record, not recommended. Uh, she would discipline my mom as young as age one if she had an accident during potty training by, by spanking her. Uh, she, if my mom would cry for any reason, would, would tell her, you want something to cry about? And slap her across the face just to, just to shut up her, her tears. Um, my grandma uh, also apparently didn't like the idea of her daughter being left-handed and so decided to change her. And she would be punished by spanking if she did her left hand to do anything. And she did ingrain in my mom the ability to use her right hand. Um, but it explains a lot when I found that out. I was like, this explains a lot in, in most things, actually, uh, of, of, of just what my mom had to have handed to her. What a, what a challenging, difficult thing that would be uh, to endure. What we're reading in Judges 3 is one of a series of 12 times that the nation of Israel lapsed into sin and then chose to suffer in so doing in a 450-year-long period between Joshua and Samuel. During that time, they would have it good, turn their back on God, experience difficulty, then be sad about the consequences, cry out to God, and he would raise up a deliverer. The, the text calls him judge, but don't think our clerical judges with the black robes and a gavel. Think of the Avengers, really. It's just this misfit you know, team of, 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 of wild people that are broken on their, in their own way, but have prolific supernatural abilities bestowed upon them from God, right? So one of them super strong, Samson, right? Hulk smash, right? Then you, you, you have the, the, the woman who nails down a guy's head to the ground with a tent peg. Black Widow. You have, <laughs> right? You see what I'm saying? Like, there's just this, 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 this team of rebels. And what we're reading uh, about is, is the left-handed one, Ehud, the left-handed Benjamite. There are three places I mentioned a moment ago in Scripture where people are singled out for being left-handed. You know what's interesting about it? 
They're all from the tribe of Benjamin. Every time, it's just must run in the family. Every single time uh, you, you have a left-handed person in scripture, it's like, well, they're from Benjamin. Uh, like in Judges 20, verse 15, it says, from the cities of that time, the children of, say it with me, Number 26,000 men who drew the sword. That's pretty good. Besides the inhabitants of Gebeah, there's 700 of them from Gebeah, 700 men. Among all this people were 700 select men who were, everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. So these lefties were mad accurate. <laughs> they, were, they were wildly good at throwing rocks out of slings. And they did so from the left hands. Um, you also have an, another account. This is 1 Chronicles 12. We won't go into it. But, but there's, there's more people who are really good with their left hands. And they, too, were from Benjamin, just like these 700 and just like our boy Ehud, all from the tribe of Benjamin. Do you know what Benjamin means? Son of the right hand. In my studies this week, I came across this tidbit and thought to myself, they're incorrectly labeled. <laughs> I'm not what you think. I'm not what you think. I know I, know I might be called right-handed. I might be associated with being right-handed. You might assume I'm right-handed, but I know something you don't know. I am not right-handed. <laughs> that is essentially what Ehud the Benjamite has to say. You kill my father, not prepared to die. He says to fat <laughs> King Eglon, in Jesus' name, amen? <laughs> Come on, say to your neighbor, I'm not what you think. And neither are you. You might have been called unlovely or stupid or dumb or lazy. You might have been made to think that you're good for nothing or you're just too much. But you have been incorrectly labeled just like Ehud was. And the cross is proof. I want to show you four things that you can turn the tables on the enemy whenever he wants you to believe the labels that people or he or even your own self, at times we can pile on ourselves. We, we don't need anybody's help to make us feel bad. We pile shame and scorn on our own selves. Four different things you can remind yourself of when you are tempted to believe that you are what other people think you are, what other people have said you are. And the first is, jot these down, salvation. Salvation. Remind yourself, hold on, hold on, hold on. I can't be right-handed. I can't be Benjamin when, in truth, I'm left-handed because I have been given salvation. And I want to I show this to you. Uh, Jesus, of course, died for sinners, right? That was the purpose. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. But we don't just see that through the cross, that that was the purpose of the cross. We even see it while the cross was playing out. Can I show it to you? In scripture, it's, this is, uh, we, could, we could do it lots of different places, but let's do it from the book of Mark. Mark chapter 15, verse 27. With him, they also crucified two robbers. How many robbers? Two. This fulfilled Old Testament prophecy, by the way, which makes the accounts of the resurrection and the death of Jesus so plausible that hundreds of year bef years beforehand, tidbits were, were stored, little geocache, you know, pro tips restored that he could not have faked. It's a part of how we know this to be credible and why it's so difficult and impossible to disprove the accounts of the Gospels. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his and the other on his. And we don't know uh, anything about these two men except for the fact that when the nails were driven into Jesus's hands and he was raised up into the air, Jesus's enemies came to gloat. And these two men who had nothing else to do joined in with them, began to mock Jesus, ridiculed Jesus. And what was Jesus' response? His response was to pray, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. 
He didn't wish that they would experience wrath. He longed for them to be free. He was praying for his enemies down below, but he was also praying for his enemies to his right and to his left, who were also responsible for him being put there. And make no mistake about this, while he was hanging on the cross, he was praying for you. For it wasn't just the Romans, and it wasn't just the Pharisees, and it wasn't just the thieves. He was dying personally for my sin and for yours. And God answered, in part, that prayer. For Luke's account kicks in towards the end of the time on the cross and has one of the thieves coming to his senses and saying to Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus responded, no way, Jose. You were making fun of me an hour ago. Have fun in hell. No, he said, assuredly, assuredly, or amen, amen. Today I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. And Jesus died shortly thereafter. The thieves' legs were broken. Jesus' legs were not. The Romans, to speed up a crucifixion, could break the legs, causing you to suffocate faster. One of the two thieves had just given his life to Christ, having moments left to live. And he had looked over and seen the face of Jesus hanging lifelessly on the cross before he died, an awful, barbaric death. But the last face he saw on earth was also the first face he saw in paradise. For Jesus didn't just say, you're going to heaven. He said, you will be with me in paradise. Imagine his surprise when Jesus was there. I, what took you so long? In heaven. Why? This was the purpose. This was just one picture to show us the purpose of the cross. The purpose of the cross wasn't just inspiration. Oh, look at him. He laid his life down for his friends. How heroic and noble. He literally came to seek and to save these thieves that were there and the men who were in front of him and you and me. Salvation is the purpose of the cross. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't an impulse buy. We've all bought stuff at Walgreens we didn't go to get. We walked out of there going, why did I fall for it again? Because they put it right there, right? Ah, coconut flavored chapstick. I don't, I don't know. Like, I... <laughs> Got him. Your salvation wasn't an impulse buy. For this purpose have I come. What does that have to do with your value and your temptation to believe that you're going to end up poor and pregnant and unmarried and drunk and divorced and whatever else you've had people speak over your future, your fears about your own future? You have value. The most important person who ever lived had you on his mind while he was dying. Your name was on his breath as he prayed for forgiveness. And once you have a salvation like that, you, co you carry yourself differently. I was sought. I was bought. I was purchased. And hang on to this. The Spirit has impressed upon me for some the importance of knowing this. When the enemy who is a thief and a murderer and a destroyer of life comes in and says, you're worthless, you might as well just end it all. Go ahead and remind back, how can I take my life when my life is not my own? I've been bought with a price. I don't even belong to me anymore. I got value. Why? Because I was given salvation, so great a salvation. Romans 5.8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You can't be worthless if you were bought with the blood of Jesus. Secondly, you have through the cross freedom. The tools for freedom are in your reach. This entire text is, uh, that we've, we've focused on, Ehud and Eglon, this whole saga, is all about the yoke of oppression being thrown off. The yoke of oppression 
being thrown off. This is, this is the fact that Israel was carrying this heavy weight. They were growing food, but this fat king would come in and steal all their food. And so they were subsisting basically on scraps. They were being oppressed. They were being taken advantage of. They were being fleeced, right? Their, 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 their livelihood was in jeopardy. And this went on for two decades, meaning that there were kids who never even knew what it looked like to live in free Israel. And he was raised up by the Lord to throw the yoke of oppression off. And Jesus intends for his spirit to move in our hearts to do the same. For there are many of us who have been bought and brought, but are still burdened, but are still limping along in the race of faith because we have yet to throw off the sin that so easily entangles, and the weights that hold us down. How must it feel to to, to run holding a heavy burden? You can't run at your full capacity when you're you're limping along and, and, and dragging things behind you. But Jesus intends for us to live in freedom. For freedom, he set us free. So what do we need to do? We need to, like Ehud, Throw off the yoke of oppression. What does that mean, Levi? The yoke of oppression. You're like, all right, noted. No yokes, right? Don't even know what that means, right? (laughs) This is heavy thing you'd put on an ox that would keep two oxen in line. The devil wants to keep you in line. He wants to keep you under his thumb. If he can't keep you from going to hell, to hell, he will, or if he can't keep you from going to heaven, rather, he will do everything in his power to keep you from living for heaven. He wants, when you get to paradise, for you to discover that you had a saved soul but a wasted life. You weren't a threat to him. You weren't delivering any other people. You weren't doing, you weren't enjoying the the, the abundant joy that there is for you to enjoy in Christ. So he wants to keep you living life with strongholds. Strongholds. What's a stronghold? It's a heavily fortified position that the enemy has, oftentimes within the border, within the camp of where God's people live. You will never experience the abundance that life can hold so long as you are content to live with a stronghold. How do strongholds get built? Because they take place in the highest ground in our life, and that is our minds, our patterns of thinking, our habits, our subconscious, involuntary decisions that we make without even thinking about it because we've been doing it so long. Here's how they happen. We, be- we, we, we hear a lie spoken over us so long we start to believe it. Or we do a, an action or a sin or a gray area thing that opens a, a foothold up so many times that we, we basically turn it into um, an automated process. Whereas it happens and plays out, we don't even realize it's even taking place in our lives anymore. And the worst mistake that we can make to try and deal with uh, this pull in the wrong direction, because that's kind of what it is. Like if you've ever had your alignment out on your car, where it just sort of drifts on its own, where it's not meant to go, that's just what it's like to live with a stronghold. You're trying to walk with Jesus, but you just veer automatically and habitually, some of you are like, that makes sense. That's language that makes sense to me because I want to walk with God, but I'm just not sensing myself moving towards him even though I'm trying. My wheels are turning. No doubt there are some strongholds involved in your life. And what the enemy tells us is if you appease the flesh, it'll go away. Well, there's this temptation. All you have to do is feed it. If you feed it, it'll stop. That's why the, te- the text isn't fat shaming, Eglon. It's, it's trying to help us to see that our flesh will never be satisfied. Our flesh will never be satisfied. He's a very fat man. He lived a life full of luxury. He will never say, I've had enough. He will continue to take from you and take from you. He'll take from your marriage. He'll take from your calling. He'll take from your children. He'll take from your family. He'll take from our church. He is ruthless. And he will get bigger and bigger and bigger like Jabba the Hutt and never say, I've had enough. An insatiable appetite who wants to to get you uh, conceived with temptation and pregnant with death. You see what I'm saying? And then it'll unfurl itself to its full and final height, and you'll realize that you are toying with a serial killer. The only way the flesh is to be dealt with is the way Ehud dealt with it, a too 
edged sword. How many of you know where I'm going with this? The word of God is living and powerful. It's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. The, the, the sword that proceeds from the mouth of Jesus, a two-edged sword. Come on, the only way to deal with the flesh is to stick a sword through its belly so deep that you can't even see the handle anymore. That's why when Jesus had the devil coming at him with lies, half-truths, which are full lies, he didn't say, let's just give in a little bit. Well, would you show me the view before I consider whether or not I'll bow down and worship you? Would, you? would you tell me more about the fact that I won't have to go to the cross and I can have an easy way and I can have this nice, comfortable life and I can have control? Would you tell me more about that? Well, I'll just give in a, I'll just put a little toe in there. Well, you know, as long as I don't cheat on my wife, so what if there's a little bit of an emotional attachment? I'm getting some of the needs for my validation from this person who, who lasted all my joy. See what I'm saying? You, that's just toying with it. That's toying with it. Jesus said, it is written. Come on on somebody. It is written. This is what God said. I'm not looking for nourishment from, from, from your little bread out of your rocks. I've got every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Come on, we got to shove the sword in fat King Eglon's belly so deep and so fast. You, you, you see, you're not even talking to the devil. You're letting Jesus do it. It is written. Let the word come from Jesus' mouth and puncture the lies that you've been, you've been absorbed in. Why? So we can walk in joy. We're reading as a church community through the New Testament this year. We've called the journey fit for the fight. We just started the book of Hebrews this week. And in Hebrews chapter one, there's an interesting prophecy given about Jesus. It's fascinating to me. I don't have it on the screen for you, but it's been my marinating truth this week. I love what is said about Jesus. It's a prophecy. It says in Hebrews 1 verse 9, you, Jesus, have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than any other of your companions. One theologian said that what this verse actually means is Jesus is the happiest person who ever lived the happiest person who ever lived. Why? Because he loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. His soul never knew any sorrow from personally sinning. Every sorrow you've ever truly felt and experienced is in some way connected to sin and suffering that it unleashes upon you. And because Jesus never gave in to Eglon but always stuck a sword through his belly, before he could build any stronghold in his heart, mind, or life, Jesus was the happiest person who ever lived. The devil's a liar. He whispers to you, you'll be happy if you do. God says, no, you'll be happy when you don't. The oil of gladness more than any of his other companions, the true joy of the Lord comes from tearing down the enemy's fortified positions in our minds and in our thoughts. When I was in Bible college, one teacher came visiting through, taught this text, and pointed out that in the King James Version, the word is dirt. The sword went in Eglon's belly until the dirt came out. The better translation would be fecal matter, but we'll allow it because it's pretty preaching. The sword goes in, he said, and the dirt comes out. The sword goes in, and the dirt comes out. And when the sword of the spirit goes into our lives, the dirty, impure places get cleaned out, get taken out, get wiped out, get, get funneled out. <laughs> Did not Jesus say, this is John 17, 17, Father, would you sanctify them by your truth? Your word is truth. So if we want to have clean lives, we must let our minds be purified daily and hourly by God's word, the truth of God's word to confront the lies of this world. Salvation, we have freedom. In Jesus' name, we have freedom. And then thirdly, we have compassion. This is, this is my true identity. I'm not, I'm, you might think I'm Benjamin. I'm a son of the left hand sucker, right? What does that mean? It means I, I can't be worthless. I can't be these things you've spoken over me, devil, because I, I get to walk in compassion. We're opened up to lives of compassion. The enemy wants us to think only of ourselves, only of what we can take. But when we tap into the power of the cross, the healing power of Jesus' left hand, we remember his mercy. We remember his compassion. You know, there's this interesting text that and I've been, of course, reading all the texts about Jesus' left hand, right? 
In, in Matthew's gospel, verse 33 of chapter 25, it talks about the last day. When every single person gets sorted, heaven and hell, friends. And just as there are unending delights in the presence of God forever, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth in a Christless eternity. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. But what I just keep thinking as I hear Jesus praying on the cross is, Lord, would you turn this goat into a sheep? Would you touch this person so they could join your flock? Would you save them and set them free so they could be with you forever? And I just keep asking God to re-break my heart for those who don't know him. Because I know the eating's so good in his house. It's so wonderful to have a table set before us in the presence of our enemies. And oh, wow, you anoint my head with oil. But I think it's so easy to, to, to enjoy the perks of life saved that we forget about a lost world. And the compassion that I hope will break our hearts and motivate us is the fact that right now is when it's decided sheep or goat. Not then. Then it's too late. Right now, while we work amongst, while we walk amongst, while we have the chance and the space to bring people into our homes and in our lives, to share the love of Jesus with them, to see someone move from his left hand to his right hand in that unique way. Olivia was locked in a bathroom once. My daughter, we were in a hotel and Lennox fiddled with something on the outside of the door, locked her in the bathroom while she was showering. She had gone into the bathroom wearing a towel and she was banging on the door for a long time before we realized from the other room, we had two connecting rooms, that she was locked in the bathroom. And we were embarrassed because we said, we'll get it open. She's like, well, hold on, I'm wearing the towel only. We're going to call building maintenance at the hotel. That's not a good plan. We'll just stay in here. You can't stay in there. I'm fine here. So this you know, good looking, young, 25-year-old buff guy with the tools comes and springs her out. And she just like, you know, thank you, and you know, runs past him. I got her permission to tell that story. But I was just thinking about how crazy would it be for Olivia to, to ever hear of anybody else locked in the door and not have compassion for them. The door from our captivity has been open, church. Let's live as, as, as sweet-spirited members of the flock, always shoving people over to make room for one more. Come on, there's more room in this flock. There's more seats in this flock. There's more room at the table. We're, we don't need to have the mentality of we got here first, so we're better in any way. We want the world to know, till everyone stranded in sin finds life and liberty in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Compassion. God, break our hearts for what breaks yours. All right, and then, and then fourthly, we're going to end here. Don't miss it. We have a tactical position, too. What? In our left-handedness. In our left-handedness, and I'm, not, I'm using that as whatever area of your life is tempted to be despised by other people, of who you are, right? In what people want you to think you need to change. Ehud was easily overlooked as someone would frisk him. He would get frisked. He knew he'd get frisked. But they assumed the TSA at Eglon's palace would be lazy and only frisk his left leg. Because if you're pulling an 18-inch long sword out of a sheath, you are not going to try and do a same leg draw. You're going to cross draw. Because could you imagine how, how easy it would be to get stuck right here? So all sheaths went on left legs. And leave it to government efficiency. <laughs> they got so good at only patting down the left leg of anybody coming in that homie was able to just cruise right through with a grin on his face. Oh, pat me down. He offers his left leg. Yeah.
What's your name? Son of my right hand. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Just the left one will be necessary, boys. Move along, move along, move along. His left-handedness, which made him different and looked down upon, made him dangerous. And so does yours. For God, 1 Corinthians 127, chooses the foolish things of the world. He loves left-handedness. And they might have been castigated throughout history, but actual left-handed people have done pretty well for themselves. 90% of America is not left-handed. And yet, five of our last 10 presidents were Ford, Reagan, Bush Sr., Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and not just our country. Let's have some fun elsewhere. Queen Victoria, Winston Churchill, Alexander the Great, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Isaac Newton, all left-handed. And a disproportionate amount of creative people, like Michelangelo, who painted the Sistine Chapel, left-handed. And he left a little Easter egg, a little booyah, on the ceiling in the Vatican. When he had Adam reaching out for God the Father, which hand of Adam's is touching God the Father's? The unclean hand, the unwanted hand, the offending hand. He was sort of leaving a finger for the rest of the right-handed world there, <laughs> painted on the ceiling. What did you think I meant by that? I meant this one. One philosopher says, it seems, hear me, all the decisive blows of history have been struck with the left hand. But not just the left hand in dominance, but also the left hand in the symbol. Oh, we don't even need to check that leg. You see what I'm saying? How about, how about the disciples? Here's a little boy with five loaves and two fishes, but pff, what are they among so many? Meanwhile, hey, the order is coming down from Peter. Count all the men. Count all the men. Count all the men. What about the women and children? They don't count. Count the men. Oh, yeah? God counts what man discounts. Where did the food come from that day? From a little boy who didn't even make it into the count. It was a left-handed miracle. How about those who turned the world upside down and gave us our scriptures and gave us the, the, the faith that we stand on? Left-handed, uncommon, a common, untaught fisherman. What's the point? God selects what man rejects. And I'm going to close with this. When Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven. Where did he go? Where did he go? He went to Mark 16, 19, the right hand of God. The right hand of God. Now, hold on. If I'm God the Father, and Jesus comes to my right hand, what hand is Jesus holding his Father's hand with? And you're in Christ. You're in Christ. God holds your left hand. God wants to use what makes you unique because he knows it also makes you exceptional. The world looks down on your left hand and says, unwanted, unlovable, stupid, lazy, dumb. You know how God sees your right hand? He sees it like we see Rafa Nadal's left hand. Look at this picture on the screen. This is Nadal. This man has played tennis with his left hand for so long. Look how disproportionately buff his left arm has become. <laughs> the world might see your left hand and not even think it needs to be frisked, your situation. God goes, it's mighty for pulling down strongholds. Come on, somebody, in Jesus' name, mighty, mighty, mighty for pulling down strongholds. And so, Father, we don't try and pretend we're not weak. We come to you to make us strong. If this is the cry of your heart, come on, lift up a hand to God. Lift up your left hand to God. Lift up your hand. Say, God, make me strong. I trust you. I need you, God. There's strongholds that need to come down. So tear them down, Jesus. Tear them down with your truth. Tear them down with your life. You can put your hands down. If you're here and you want to trust Jesus for salvation, do it right now. Say to God, I need you. Say to God, forgive me. Say to God, cleanse me. Make me yours. I believe Jesus died in my place and rose from the dead. 
I believe he's coming again. I give my heart to you. I give you my life in Jesus' name.